Our next presenter is Tan Zong Xuan, who did a project on distributed image processing for use in brain visualization. Right, so for the past few weeks, I've been working at the Song Lab, and over there, I've been developing a piece of software called Omni. Now, Omni is an application for visualizing, editing, and skeletonizing images of the brain. After four weeks of work on it, I'm now proud to call myself one of the developers. Right, so, but what exactly does Omni do? Why do we want to edit images of the brain? For that, we have to look to the field of connectomics, which is an emerging field that studies connectomes. Now, connectomes are maps of neurons and all the, in, the neural connections in between them. And how these maps are constructed is that, first, you have microscopes image many slices of brain tissue building up the 3D image stack. Then you have either humans or computers analyze that image data and trace or segment the neurons, therefore determining how, whether they're connected. So as you can guess, this process is extremely time consuming. For example, the first connectome that, that was ever constructed was that of C. elegans. That had only 300 neurons and something like 8,000 neural connections. But the whole process took well over a decade. And so if you calculate that, that works out to, to about something like 0.5 neural connections per person per day. So it's either, either they were really slacking off or you know, it was really that hard. <laughs> so, but the hope is that with better segmentation software, we can even better and more accurate segmentation software, we can eventually map out the entire human brain, something like a human connectome project. And that, and that will be as, as empowering in the field of neuroscience as the Human Genome Project was in genetics. Now, the problem is that no matter how, how, how good your computer segmentation software is, and no matter whether you're using fancy computer vision systems with artificial neural networks, what they output is still imperfect. So what you have to do is you have to validate it. You have to get humans to see whether it's correct. And Omni lets you do this. It does this by first importing the raw image data as well as the pre-generated segmentation data and displays it to users in 2D and 3D for them to view and edit. And here's a screenshot of Omni doing just that. So over here, we have the raw image data, which you call the channel data. And here we have the, the segmentation data. And here are the 3D meshes. So when you, you're viewing this data, you want to be able to zoom in and zoom out, right? You want to be able to view the entire image, the entire volume, or just a small part of it. And right here, we have a problem. So let's say you have a very nice display over here, very standard display, about 1024 pixels in height. Then we want to display this very large source image of brain data, because these things are extremely high resolution. So let's say we manage to image the entire human brain. And let's say it was cubic, so we represent it by the square over here. Let's see how far, how large the square goes. It's going to be way, way, way larger than the computer display. And imagine telling your poor little graphics card, that scale this all the way down and display on that invisible little computer screen over there. That's going to kill your graphics card. So <coughs> what, how do we solve this? We solve this by the process of mid mapping. So how this works is that taking the source image data, we pre-build using the CPU down sampled versions of that data. So this is the source image data. We scale it down to half its size and keep doing that until it goes below a certain threshold level. And each level of downsampling is known as a MIP level. So the source image is called MIP level zero, then you have MIP level one, and so on. So what I did was make this process faster because we're working with tremendous amounts of data here, so we want to make it go as fast as we can. So the first way I made it faster is look at how exactly the data is subsampled. So we're taking a cube, right, and making it to half its size. So we're essentially, we're taking for every eight voxels or volumetric pixels, we're making it become one voxel. And we can do this in a variety of ways. We can take the mean, the mode, the, uh, take a random voxel, or we can take the primary voxel, which is the topmost, leftmost, frontmost voxel. And the thing is, users of Omni in the Song Lab decided that the fir these first three modes of doing it produce subsampled data that was blurry. So they didn't use it anymore. But the thing was, they were still performing read operations on all these seven other voxels when they didn't need to. So I came along and noticed this, and I just removed those seven read operations. So that's something like seven out of nine operations removed. 
and let's see what the performance test data shows. We get something like, for the large image data, a lot, the largest volume, 90 seconds to 12 seconds. That's a 7.13 times speed increase. But more importantly than just this, because this is something very, a trivial change, I rewrote the mid-mapping process to run in parallel, which is to say using multiple threads on as many cores of a, of a computer as possible. This is a, as opposed to how it was originally done, which is in serial, on a single core. And I can tell you from personal experience that this was ridiculously slow. Right, so let's look at how it was originally done, the serial build process. So let's say we have the first mid-level, mid-level N over here, and we, sp we split each level up into many equally sized chunks, which we call MIP chunks. So we do this process chunk by chunk because it's in serial. So let's, go let's say mid level N is already built, we want to build mid level N plus one. So it, we look at this one, we look at the, child, the eight child chunks it came from. Then we downsample that. And so we keep going on. Right, so I have a nice little stop motion animation here. And finally, we are done with mid-level n plus one. Then we go ahead and do that with mid-level n plus two as well. And then we are finally done. So the problem with this process is, is that not only does it go chunk by chunk, it also goes level by level. So even if we were to multi-thread this, a thread that wanted to build mid-level n plus two would wait, have to wait for all the threads to build finish mid-level n plus one. So what ideally we should want to do instead is we take the, the first MIP level and distribute that in, in, into many chunks and give each chunk to a worker thread. And each of those threads downsamples that chunk all the way to the root MIP level. The downsamples that all the way to the, as, as much as it can go. So that seems like it's a lot faster, right? But we have yet another problem, yet another problem which is to say the chunks need to be large enough to be downsampled that many times. So we were originally working with MIP chunks, and those, due to the way the program is designed, is, are always the same size. So what I did was create another construct called a thread chunk, which is dynamically sized. And so the more MIP levels, the larger the thread chunks. And, but still, we have, we, have to, we have to bound this in some way, because we can't have it too small, because then we get a very large number of chunks. And we can't have it, and that will add a lot of I.O. load. But if you have it too large, it's going to take immense amounts of memory. So we, we, we bounded it something like this, using certain parameters. And in, so we have to modify, modify the process again, because once you have upper bound, we can't downsample all the way to the, as much as we can, as, we, as much as we would like. So what we do is we starting from initial MIP level I, we split it up into as large chunks as we can. Then, downsample those chunks as much as possible, and recombine all these one by one by one blocks back into something, some lower mid-level, I plus N. And we repeat until we finally reach the lowest level, I mean the highest level. So that's all very good in theory. How fast does it actually go? So over here we have the performance test results for the serial and parallel channel builds. And so we can see that we went from something like originally 90 seconds, now we're at two seconds. And similarly for segmentation builds, which are slightly different from channel builds, we take something like 90 seconds, I mean 230 seconds to 30 seconds. So overall, when we were using 30 threads on my test platform, we had, we gained, we had a 16 to 48 times speed increase on channel builds and four to 10 times speed increase on segmentation builds. And that's very large. Right, so future work, we, we can still improve how, how fast the segmentation builds go because it's not going as fast as we would like. And furthermore, we could actually further distribute this whole process to run across as many computers on a computer cluster as possible. And I leave it to you to think how fast that would be. And with that, I would like to thank my mentors, Matt Wimmer and Michael Pocaro, who are way over there, totally awesome mentors, and others at the Sung Lab, like, such as Alex, Srini, and Dr. Sebastian Sung himself, as well as CE, MIT, and the Research Science Institute, and the Ministry of Education, Education Singapore for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Are there any questions?
Yeah. The level of parallelism in each of the different levels overlaps the computation partially of the previous levels. Are you doing any kind of uh, computation level parallelism so that uh, you're reusing the computation uh, from one level to the next? Reusing the computation? Right. In, in other words, to do n plus 1 involves the same computation as uh, level n minus a few pieces. Mm -hmm. So if you do the parallelism at the computation level, you should be able to get an additional speed up. The question is, are you doing the, um, the parallelism at a computational level to reuse computation? Yes? Sort of, yeah. Uh, okay. I'm not exactly understanding your question, but one thing I did do was that basically there's much less input and output going on because when you do it level by level, what you're doing is you read a chunk, then you build the next, the lower, the next mid levels chunk, then you save that chunk. Whereas in this process, what we're doing is we read the chunk and we keep downsampling. So we're saving all those chunks in data, in the memory. So they're all, it's, there's much less input output going on and that saves us a lot of time. Right, well, the point is that if you organize the computation so that the computation that gets you from level 0 to level 1, uh, which um, is organized in the, same, in the proper order, then it's uh, including the computation that gets you from level n plus 1 to n plus 2. And so uh, what you're doing is, uh, uh, what you would be doing is a form of dynamic programming where you would be uh, organizing the computations that you don't have to do the same computations more than once. Right. And so you would be oh, able right. to fold up all the lower levels into a single okay, computation. Yeah. So, so basically what you're saying is that you take that original primary voxel and use it all the way down. Yes. Yes. Uh, I've been, I've been, I didn't really think of that and to actually implement that would require some very interesting programming structure that, that is just not easy to read, right? Yeah. When you went to the 16 CPU computer, mm -hmm. did it run 16 times faster or less? Less. Um, the question is when you went to a 16 CPU computer, did it run 16 times faster or less? Okay, I have to clarify this. On, for all the performance tests were, were, were conducted on the same 16 core computer. So it was, it was just that originally it couldn't run in multi-threaded multi, multi fashion, and now it can. But this, this speed increase is uh, together with the, or, the speed increase, the 7.13 times speed increase from the changing the subsample algor algorithm. Okay, so when, if, you, if you control all other variables mm -hmm. and only change it from running serially to running 16 threads in parallel on the 16-thread <laughs> machine, what was the factor? Uh, I, I, I don't think I calculated the factor, but I'm pretty sure it's less than 16, yeah. What accounts for that? Because, because there's still I.O. going on, in, input output going on, and that's definitely serial. And it's like the read-write operations in this program still, still are in the serial. So, you, so for each MIP level, you can't have multiple threads reading it from, from it at the same time. What did you do to measure how much was being spent in I.O. if you measured that? Oh, you can, you can just like at timers within the read and write functions. Yeah. Another question? So what is the application able to do now, or what are users the application able to do now that they could not before this 10x to 50x speed improvement? Oh, the question is, um, what are users able to do now that they couldn't do before this speed improvement? So they just have to wait much less time. Yeah. And it was, I can say it was pretty irritating to wait for like, uh, 250 seconds just to, for the thing to build. Yeah, and, and these are re reasonably small volumes. These, the largest volume I worked with was 750 cubed voxels. Um, I think the largest one that the Songlet currently has is something like 300 gigs in size. And that's, so the wall clock time is reduced by a, tr a tremendous amount, right? And, and what's the impact of that on research? Oh, it just makes workflow faster because when the new volumes come in, they, they can build it faster. Also, Omni is currently under active development, so oftentimes they add a new feature as they rebuild the volume. Do we have any other questions? Back in the middle. Did you investigate uh, what happens when you keep on adding more cores and then like the CPU level off because of the overhead from communication costs? Um, the thing is, I can't very easily add cores to a machine. Yeah, I, I couldn't buy like five core machines, could I? 
don't know, I'm not very good into the time table. It's just hard to restrict based on number of courts. So you start with six courts, can you do it so it works on two courts and three courts and four courts? And then see what happens when you no, but you could do that. The simplest thing would be to do is change this number, the, t the, n the maximum number of threads you're using. So even on a 16 core machine, you can, you can use only one thread, which is what I was doing over here. Then you can increase that to two threads, three threads, then maybe at some point you find some optimal level of threads. One more question. You mentioned that when you were downsampling that uh, choosing the primary chunk was, uh, saved a lot of operations. Yes. Um, so, uh, what, are, what are the disadvantages of using this method and why are you not using the original algorithm? No, they were, they were, uh, can I, it's a bit hard to go back to that slide. So, they, they, they were using this, it's just that they were still doing these read operations unnecessarily. So, yeah, but in fact, I think if you use, use the mode, it's more accurate because well, if you use the mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get blurry. The mode, I, 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 I think, is, is supposed to be more accurate, but I would much prefer like a 7.13 times speed increase than having to read all these things just for accuracy. Okay, thank you very much. Right.